Awesome. It's a great audience. I don't even say anything. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, who knows what the number is in the event title? What is that number? What does it mean? 118. Thank you. You get an extra free something. <laughs> so these events have been free since 2007 when we started doing that. And we've been doing that nonstop every month for uh, this is the 118th one. Uh, my name is Murat. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, ERA. And here uh, I have Justin, one of our partners. Uh, after the event, you can go talk to him if you want to complain about something about ERA. <laughs> and Emily, program director number two. Ina, our global program manager, and Katarina Daniels, our venture partner. Go like this. All right. So, after talking to them, come to me. <laughs> cool. So, great to have you here. Uh, tonight, actually, I'm actually very, very excited because I've been trying to get Mikhail for a long time. Mikhail uh, started as an LP. Uh, LP means limited partner, uh, people who invest in funds. So, he was an LP in our fund. Then we realized he was actually an entrepreneur, so we made him a mentor. Then we realized he's actually good, so we made him a lead mentor. <laughs> then we were like, oh my god, like he's really good, so we made him a venture partner. So right now he's a venture partner, mentor, lead mentor, and a limited partner in our fund. And as you will soon find out, he does lots of different things. And he grew the facial hair especially for tonight. So you have to pay extra attention. Yeah. He's gonna cut it like right after the event. But I'm very excited. Uh, you will, I'm not, I don't want to do any spoilers, so he will tell you about his background, but really amazing entrepreneur investor. We are so like proud to have him as part of the ERA family. We are going to listen to his background, his bio, how he got here, and most importantly, what he invests in. Who here has a startup? Who are the entrepreneurs here? And who is raising money sometime in the future? Okay, cool. You are in the right place. After that, we are going to do a short Q&A. And after the Q&A, we have five really amazing companies that we picked to pitch tonight. They're going to come up here and pitch for four minutes. And Mikhail will give them uh, feedback, advice, and you brought cash, right? That's what we need. Okay. People don't take checks anymore. Just cash. After that, if there's time at the end, we'll do one impromptu pitch. We'll pick somebody randomly. He will pick, and this person will come up here and pitch. And after that, uh, some people may go across the street to Beer Authority, second floor, and get more drinks. But uh, one of our great partners, Norwegian government, is here, Ulla, also in Porsrom, with three Norwegian companies. So please. After the event, go talk to them, show them New York, you know, partnership, hospitality, and then uh, try to engage with them. But again, I'm very excited to have Mikhail tonight, so I'll have him start speaking. And if you have friends at Microsoft, tell them Murat thanks Microsoft at the event. Okay? All right, thank you. Awesome. So, here's Mikhail. Thank you. Microsoft for the hospitality. Um, I just so I know more about the way the cook survey. It looks like a lot of you guys are entrepreneurs, but I just want to get a sense by the industry who is here from the finance space. All right, perfect. No. <laughs> How about technology? What's that, guys? All right, good. Um, advertising, marketing, media. All right, good. We got a little bit of everyone. Fashion. People, all right, cool. Sounds like looks like a good New York mix, so it's good. So I'll give you guys a quick background of kind of how you know I got here uh, and uh, how I ended up knowing Murat, how 
he ended up dragging me into ERA. So it's it's fine. You, up, uh, you know, over a period of time, you just a lot of times, you know, you gotta be in the right. People say you gotta be in the right space in the, you know, the right time and kind of take action based on that. And I think a lot of kind of entrepreneurs that are a lot more successful than I am, um, you know, that's kind of you know I've seen you know, many kind of successful things <coughs> play out, and I've made you know, a number of them that I've seen from ERA, from Y Combinator, and everything in between. Kind of how they ended up there, and you know, a lot of times it was you know smart guys. And not so smart, being in the right space at all times. So you know, it always comes down to sort of, do you want to be smart or lucky, or you know, where are you on that spectrum? Um, so with, having said that, um, I came to the United States in 97 uh, from Russia. Um, got an electrical engineering degree from Boston University. So halfway through the program, when I was a, uh, a sophomore, I was in Boston, obviously, it was 2000. 2005. Um, a friend of mine ended up working for, I think, New York Times actually, so right across the street. And uh, his boss at the time said, hey, listen, there's a bunch of Harvard professors putting together this thing. You should definitely apply. So, you know, what did we do? We got together, we started drinking, and uh, we applied to Y Combinator. So that was the first class uh, back in 2005. <coughs> And somehow we got in. Um, I wasn't really sure. I they, uh, you know, they saw my background at Boston University. They were from Harvard. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm into you, but I think it's Mike from Harvard. So it was good. So we went through the program, which was uh, very much an experiment at the time. Uh, because there was no such thing as sort of, you, know, you have to go into your YC, so you can say, you have your VC space, right? You know, Five million plus. Then you had your kind of angel investors that were doing this as a, uh, no, like a hobby almost. There was nothing, um, nobody was doing this. Um, I'm talking about you know, angel and kind of startup investments um, you know, on a professional basis. And the YC was very much, you know, obviously the, the pioneer at the time, but the first class was very much an experiment. And I remember talking to Paul Graham um, about it. I was like, you know, what's the, you know, what prompted you guys to do this? And, uh, you know, they said, hey guys, if you fail, you know, this is it. We're not going to do this together. But what ended up happening is actually with some company that I founded with two my uh, two my partners, we were the first exit for them uh, about half half a year in, into the program, uh, which was not really conventional at the time. Um, but uh, it seemed like that the experiment turned out to be successful, and uh, from that, um, you know, a number of other accelerators kind of you know spread forth. Um, because the model works, right? And as we clearly see, but it doesn't work for everyone, right? And you know, we've seen a, a lot of these accelerators out there, kind of having different models and having their own approach. And uh, you know, that's what you know. I'll talk about kind of how we look at investing into companies, but that's what really attracted me to what Morad was doing. Because number one, you know, they're passionate about what they're doing, and when we look at investing in companies, that's probably the number one thing we look at. How passionate are the founders in what they're doing. You know, are, are they only there for a money grab? And you know, I think a lot of you follow the, the whole ICO space and blockchain, we can talk about that, but it felt like you know, there was a big uh, you know, aspect of that, you know, just going for the like, money grab move. And uh, you, know, you got to kind of factor there in the equation. So anyway, so I did YC. Um, I started another company. So we did that for two years. I filled out business, moved to California. I didn't want to move to California because I really like shade posting weather, so I decided to stay. And I uh, started another company, which was more of a learning experience. But um, you know, over the last, since I've been doing this, you know, 10 plus years, I've realized that uh, good lessons are usually pretty expensive. So, um, you know, in terms of time, you know, time, money, sometimes it's the same thing. Uh, so the second company was very much a more learning experience. And I want to get an MBA because um, I want to see kind of what the business was all about um, after being an engineer. And uh, you know, they gave me a whole different perspective because uh, you know, working with code is actually very easy. Working with people, you know, you never know what they're going to do. Code is, you know, two, two plus two is four, right? Sometimes. It, it actually depends. It depends on 
or whether you're buying or you're selling, right? So, not, not all the time. Yeah, and um, so rather than being halfway through the program, I started interning, or I started looking for internships at uh, investment banks. And then uh, I got actually, so instead of getting an internship at Morgan Stanley, I ended up stealing a couple of guys from the bank to start the fund, uh, the Median Capital, which is what we run right now. Uh, so that was in 2011. So since 2011, we've done billion plus in the uh, 250 plus in transactions, everything from kind of early stage stuff to later stage publicly traded companies and everything in team, real estate, getting to crypto blockchain. Yeah, so initially we started with uh, capital markets, so trading syndicate, uh, basically participating in the book building process with investment banks, uh, doing all of the IPOs, all the secondaries, uh, that kind of got extended more into trading uh, and hiring and traders, but then I realized that uh, it's not as simple as just hiring people, you actually gotta you know, tell them what to do. So, you know, and it's all about figuring out what you go that way, and you know, it takes a little bit of time. So, we have our capital markets group that does trading investments. We also give money to other funds, other private equity shops that, so that's something to think about, right? Uh, you know, the question is always, do you want to develop it yourself, or do you want to outsource it? And, you know, whether you're trading or allocating money, and it's actually the same thing when, if you are building your own company, do you hire people internally to build out the product, or do you outsource it, right? And we see that all kind of throughout that spectrum. Um, so trading investments, that's our capital markets group. Uh, we have a structured products group that works with publicly traded companies on M&A, debt restructuring, roll-ups. So think of it as, you know, sometimes companies don't want to go to market, uh, publicly. They want to have one institutional investor that will work with them on putting together a product that will help them either buy another company or restructure that or do a spin off. So that's structured products. Uh, we have a kind of what I call a venture capital group that uh, mostly gives money to Morad actually. But um, you know, we, we do some of, uh, you know, uh, kind of one off investments as well. Um, some ERA companies and some, some not. But, um, kind of think of it as just private investments, right? Um, and then we have a fourth group that's a real estate group. So we do equity investments, we do debt investments, and sometimes we take on projects to develop ourselves that um, that we like, but we couldn't necessarily, for whatever reason, find a GP uh, to partner up with. Because the idea is, you know, like I mentioned before, whether you want to outsource or build something internally is, you know, how you, if you're going to do it internally, you have the team, you have the expertise, you have the know-how, you have the resources, right? If you can have someone do it better, then why not have someone do it better, right? Uh, so that's kind of the you know, uh, recurring topic. Um, so we actually own four hotels here in New York. Uh, we do debt investments all throughout the country. We actually spun out our debt strategy uh, as a separate fund because it makes it a little easier to leverage on the portfolio basis, get credit lines, sign up JVs, yeah, yeah. Legal stuff, but uh, that's pretty much it. That's, that's the whole fun. So the idea is, you know, again, working with smart people that you can trust. Um, you know, when I'm hiring someone, and I think that's you know, a word of advice for a lot of you guys that are building your own companies, is that you know, do you want to hire someone really smart, but you might not, you might not necessarily trust, or would you rather hire someone that maybe not as smart, but you can trust, right? And to me, it's always came down to the trust factor more than anything. Because even you know, as simple as you know, if they can't execute something, they'll tell you about it, right? So like simple and you know, uh, the devil's in the details. So, so that's my background. Um, what should we do? Recent investments. Startup investments. Startup investments. Uh, recent investments. What kind of startups are you investing? What kind of startups are you investing? Okay. So let me explain our investment process when we look at startups, right? First, I mentioned that. Um, the number one thing we looked at, and that's really kind of the easiest thing to look at at first, is how excited someone about what they're doing. Right? If someone comes over and uh, I've actually, I'm not going to name a startup, but I have a startup that failed actually in the ERA. And there's nothing wrong with it, right? Because uh, what's the probability? Like nine, no, eight, eight out of ten startups fail. Nine, you might get your money back, and then ten, you're going to hit it out of the park, right? So, I remember once our came uh, came by, 
to raise some money. And uh, you know, there was they had a bunch of people on the team, and they were not. They were like, oh, you know, like we're doing this, and this is how we're going to do. You can clearly tell that they were not passionate about what they're doing. So if someone's not passionate about what they are doing, why should I be passionate about what you're doing, right? So you gotta kind of portray that. Even you might not feel that way, right? But it's all about the message. So that's number one. Are you passionate about the product? <coughs> Number two is, are you passionate about your product? And number three is what? Right? So those tough things. Uh, because if you're passionate, and I've actually seen that play out a number of times, um, even if your initial idea might not necessarily be successful, um, they'll find a way to do it. And um, the one story I like to tell is, uh, I think most of you probably heard of Reddit, right? So, Initially, it was not a front page for the web. It, they had, I don't remember what the idea was, but it was something really stupid. And uh, as Paul Graham would have told uh, both Alexis um, and uh, Stephen that he, he liked them, but he told them to come back with something else. So I think they reworked them, that's how, that's how it was going. The other company from the first YC class that um, I like, uh, you know, I, I like to use them as an example. It's, it demonstrates perseverance and a lot of other things. So actually, before I'll tell you what it is, um, one of the founders used to crash on my couch because he was homeless for a few months, but he's now worth half a billion dollars. So definitely paid off. Um, so the first, uh, so that company, uh, its first product used to be called uh, Kiko, which is an on online calendar. Before Google came out with its own online calendar. So the year was 2005. Basically prehistorical times. Um, and I remember after they put out their product, two weeks later, and they were very, very excited. So Ajax just came came out like you know that time frame. So you know, we started getting all these cool technologies that we can use to do a synchronous JavaScript, um, being able to send messages back and forth, uh, <coughs> server uh, seamlessly without refreshing the pages. It was really cool, um, and they were very, very excited about it. Um, they had no idea how they were going to make money yet, but that's a different topic. Um, and then uh, Google obviously came out completely crushed it, so they were devastated. I think they ended up selling their code, code base on eBay for like 300 grand at the time, which was uh, an incredible move. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I was talking to Justin, I was like, listen, so what are you going to do? Like, you know, you made a little bit of money, and uh, well, I, said, nah, I don't know, I'm going to just wear this camera on top of my head and kind of broadcast my life. So I was like, listen, you're not even that interested. <laughs> Who would want to follow you 24 7? Like, doesn't make any sense. Like, no, 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 it's, it's okay. Like, go we'll figure something out. Like, all right, cool. So, obviously, we was wearing camera on this at 24 7, broadcasting his life. And uh, as a result of that, they needed to, to write uh, a server to be able to handle all the video streaming. And that did not exist. So, a stupid idea basically was the foundation for creating a really cool technology. And uh, I think some of you might know which company I'm talking about. Um, Justin T was born from that. And then um, they were actually not having very much success with that. And um, what ended up happening, one of the subsets was called uh, was the gaming channel, which morphed into Twitch down the line. So the rest is history. But you know, the, the reason why I'm you know, telling you guys this story is that you have a bunch of smart guys that are not giving up. You know, they're passionate about what they're doing, and they're not afraid to experiment. You know, I mean, again, it's all about kind of being passionate about the product. And, um, not just in the by product, I mean like one specific thing, but about then what you like to do. So you got to find something you realize that you like. And that's why people are like, oh, you know, you got to find a job that you really enjoy. But it's not that. So anyway. Well, that's the first three criteria, right? And then we've got to go into the realistic stuff, right? Does your idea make any sense? All right, you know, how do we, do you have any revenues, right? So pre-revenue, post-revenue. Um, you know, who are the rest of the team? Who are your advisors? Um, does your idea have any kind of basis? Is it grounded in the reality? Is it something insane? And, you know, I've seen insane ideas that actually went out to make a lot of money. Just like I've seen really good ideas Going to be completely bust. So everything in between. I mean, you kind of, you know, the world evolves at a very quick pace. So something is rolling now might not be rolling in the future. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So la latest investment. 
let's see, I, uh, I invest in Kamala, which is an interesting startup. I do um, management software for marinas, which is pretty interesting because you think, you know, like how, like how does this make any sense? But apparently it's uh, paper, literally, you know, businesses run on paper napkins, and they need to evolve to kind of keep up with the times and kind of defense that. So it's pretty cool. Uh, why didn't we invest in them? Um, I think there's a strong uh, opportunity for pref recurring preferability. And actually, a big big reason why I ended up investing in Volvo is because of Sandberg. Sandberg, um, I think some of you guys know, is a subscription-based business for perfume. Um, I'm probably not the candidate for it, but we'll really, um, you guys can look up the story. But um, what I really like about the fact that, so Maria is the CEO, and uh, she was really passionate about what she was doing. So I kind of you know, looked at the, the model, and it started, it made sense to me because it's a pretty sticky, uh, it's a pretty sticky subscription. Um, it's a good product. There's nothing like that out in the market. Um, you know, we, I initially invested into them when they were doing, I think, basically zero. And now, I think it's, if I have to take a guess, they're probably doing like 50 million in recurring revenue or something along those lines. So, Zero to 50 million recurring revenues in about three years. Um, why and what can we learn from that? One is they're really passionate about what they do. Right? They figured out the model. Initially, it didn't really work. Uh, you know, working with suppliers and working with everything, you know, putting everything together. And that's not you know, the other thing is like, a lot of people look at kind of the entrepreneurs and uh, you know, people that are on companies and say, oh, like you know, it's starting this business, got an idea. It's you know, they, they only see sort of the result. It's very difficult to see, like everything, all the work that went into building it. So if you look at an iceberg, right, floating in the ocean, you only see the top. You don't see 90% of it that's floating in the ocean, right? So it's about the details, about kind of day-to-day -day things that you put into building it. And uh, you know, I'm an engineer by background, and you know, you, the, some of you guys are also engineers, I would assume, and as you know, to build a system, the system is a just a summation of its parts, right? You don't build the whole thing at once. You build it kind of one little thing at a time, and then you put it together. So think of, of Google, for example, right? Google didn't get to where they are today overnight, right? They started off with kind of, you know, very, you know, now it's simple, but, you know, it's, there's, you know, we know the page rank algorithm, started with that, and then over time they added all of these search functionalities. You know, the auto, auto completion, they didn't have that. You know, 10 years ago, so it's again summation of parts, right? But uh, it's pretty much it. Um, What's the best way to get in touch with you? That's the email. <coughs> but I might ignore you. Unless uh, the, best, the best way to get in touch with me is if Murat emails me and tells me I should post it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way. Uh, second best way, yeah, just email me. I mean, I'm pretty good. Okay, so yes. You mentioned before you invested in a few hotels. Yes. I'm curious which hotels they are and what you're doing to combat uh, the shared economy and then hotels that are moving towards a millennial focus model. Yes. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, believe it or not, uh, Airbnb and all shared economy is not the biggest competitor to hotels. The biggest, and I wouldn't say competitor, but the biggest um, right. issue with hotels is the fact that uh, all these aggregator sites like Expedia, and, you know, there's a ton of them, take about 30% cut on, uh, on bookings. And if you want to book a hotel, where do you go to book it? Go to Marriott.com? No, you go to Expedia. Um, but, yeah, that's to answer that, that question. So, the second part of your question, you know, which hotels do we own? Uh, we own the Beacon which is the financial district. If you guys have never been there, check it out. We actually just opened up uh, the lounge downstairs it's by the same guy uh, that did last year. It's pretty cool. Um, probably should get a reservation first time. Um, we own the JFK Crown Plaza by JFK. Uh, so no reason to stay there until, you know, unless you're staying in the airport um, or traveling overnight. We own, um, so we just bought another one on 42nd Street. It's still kind of under wraps, so I can't release the name. And um, yeah, so what that was interesting to this. Do you invest in the co-working space? You know, I've looked at a bunch of them, uh, and there's just so many of them. It's very hard. It's very hard. I mean, everything's a hard business, but um, there's just a lot of them. 
Would you be interested in a pitch? They would get listened to. It. <laughs> Is it profitable? Uh, you're open three months, you got about 40,000 in recurring revenue. Is it profitable? It should be in about a month or two. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned um, money grab in the yeah. same sentence as ICOs and blockchain. Yes. I'm curious what you think about uh, the whole technology and uh, distributed apps as a whole. Yes. Um, I think there's a lot of potential, and I think everyone would agree that there's a lot of potential, right? There's no surprise there. Um, the reason why I mentioned better, so a lot of people, I think, go on, you know, initially, we've got to stay set back for a second, right? The reason why we have rules and regulations in the you know, called stock market space, right, is to protect investors from making dumb decisions because. <coughs> Most investors, as far as it comes down to you know, being uneducated about investors, can make smart decisions. And the reason why again, we have regulations is to protect them. Um, when the kind of ICO fed started happening, um, obviously there's no regulations in that space. And I think that that's why we've seen a sort of a lot of kind of negative sentiment around that because a lot of people, I mean, there's definitely a lot of uh, potential to make money. I mean, I'm, I'll be the first one to tell you that we participated in the whole thing. But uh, again, you know, the laws exist for a reason. And it's going to take a little bit of time for it to play out for all the regulatory bodies to get together and agree on how um, it should be done. I mean, listen, there is a lot of opportunity there. There's also a lot of, uh, I think, risks to lose money. And there's also a lot of risks to get in trouble, I mean, especially if you're an issuer and you're issuing unregistered securities in the form of utility tokens, but you know, they don't pass the housing test, then they're security. Right? You, know what I mean? you could do it in another country, right? That's not subject to US laws and regulations, which is fine. But if you're issuing unregistered I mean, utility tokens that look and smell and behave like a security token, you, know, you can get in trouble with the law. So I hope that answers the question. Yes. How do you keep yourself uh, sharp? It's just that peel back the layers and ask questions. Because you have so many people coming at you with yeah. every idea in the world. So what do you do to just kind of play your head and be able to, to just focus and ask the right questions, peel back the layers, and find the best ones? Yeah. So, I asked that question I saw you on the mountain, like in the photo or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great question, actually. Uh, two answers to that. One is, and I try to surround yourselves with people that know more about the subject than you do. Right? You surround yourself with the smartest people possible. And uh, you know, people say try to be the stupidest person in the room, but yeah, you're only the stupidest person in the room. <laughs> when you surround yourself with smart people that you can rely on, and you know, that's what I was talking about, trust, right? You can trust someone to give you an honest answer, not an answer that you want to hear, but an answer that you should hear. And then the second part, though, so a couple of years ago, a friend of mine said we should hike Mount Rainier. So I you know, said, hey, what happened? Let's do it. How dangerous can it possibly be? And I felt like I got PTSD from that, to be honest with you. But it was also really cool because uh, when, you know, I didn't realize how like, intense, you, you feel like you're on a you know, different planet. I mean, for those, you guys seen Interstellar, the movie, if you know, like that ice planet, felt like I was there. Um, I've never served in the army, but I would, or in the you know, armed forces, but I would imagine um, that it's kind of like that, where when we were you know, hiking to the top, um, it was the first time I was really afraid for my life, because it was the first time when you can't just leave. So, you know, you guys are in this room, now, nothing is stopping you from getting up and leaving. But when you're there, at 14,000 feet, very little oxygen, um, you're tied into other people, um, you can't leave, you can't bounce. So you've got to you know, continue, you've got to kind of follow through. And uh, it was interesting because you know, I've never been in that situation. And for some reason, we we're going to do it again <laughs> this year. Um, what? You know, well, no, I think so. The ring year, we're going to come back to that in 10 years. We're saving it for reunion. But this year, we're doing Kilimanjaro. So actually, so what we, what we started doing, and you know, to, to your point about clearing your head, I think it's very important to step back. And you know, you're, when you're in kind of on the ground floor and you know, you're running a company and you're building stuff, it's it's important to be able to step back and kind of look at it. But it's very difficult to do. 
it's easy to say that it's very difficult. To put. And when you get away from everything, you have your phone, you know, you're looking out. I mean, listen, we human bodies have changed relatively, you know, over the last couple hundred thousand years. But technology has evolved very, very quickly. So I, I don't think our bodies are designed from an evolution point of view to, to handle this much information. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, what? Like, I don't even know what, what, what's the hottest thing right now. Um, I think Instagram is doing something like they call Snap and Snap is stuff like that. I, nothing makes sense anymore. So our bodies are not designed to process this much information. So, so I think it's important to be able to step back and get away from everything, go back to nature, kind of, you know, disconnect, and you know, allows you to kind of clean up yourself a little bit and you know, not think about the um, mission. But yeah, so one, one thing that I started doing is we're actually doing this as a kind of uh, corporate uh, bonding event, if you will. You know, some companies go out to get some beers, and uh, we go to Clarkson Mountains. Yes. Uh, what sectors are you most excited about for the next few years that you might be out there? There's, uh, well, it depends. It's, you know, we're, we're basically invested in a lot of different stuff, so I think it's important to, you know, we're, we're really, okay, we, we can talk about boring stuff, like real estate. We love real estate, right? We love real estate. Um, you probably expect it to blockchain. We like blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, I think that's pretty, you know, anything that has to do with sustainable resources. Is interesting. I actually just got a Tesla a couple of weeks ago. I will tell you right now, I'm never buying another car that doesn't have an autopilot feature. It's actually it's incredible how American the car is. It's for the laziest people possible. <laughs> I'm not joking. You come out, the door opens. You sit down, you press the pedal, the door closes. So it's very like the, the quality and finishes of the car is not that good. But as far as having like these very thoughtful things, and the, you know, it's interesting how they approach the whole thing because um, you know, they sit down and they say, you know, let's, if we have to build a car from ground up, let's do it. You know, the, I, it's, I got a Model X, so the windshield goes all the way to the top, so you don't feel like you're you know, claustrophobic. You can actually see everything in front of you. So I drove from Boston, I was doing a lecture at Boston University. <laughs> I drove from Boston to New York uh, on one charge, that should enough juice. I drove maybe 20 minutes. The other three hours, the car was driving itself. It was awesome. My wife was freaking out. <laughs> Andre, oh, thank you so much. One more Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, so now we have five companies who are going to come up here and pitch. Uh, if you're like a better car than Tesla, you might be in luck. But the first company I think you're going to like because. Um, is coming up here to teach us property plot. You have four minutes, and let's encourage him. Thank you, Mara, and thanks, Yuri, for having us. So I'm going to start by asking you all a question. Why is searching for real estate online such a nightmare? Why, when you go online, go on a listing site, search for a new home, why do you have to worry about, is this listing real? Am I going to get hit with thousands of dollars in broker fees? Is somebody going to try to scam me or steal my identity? So the answer to that question is actually, we let it be so. So I'm going to tell you a brief story about how a listing gets to market. So what happens right now is, I have a listing, I'm a landlord, or I'm, I'm a landlord, I want to sell my property. So I go out there and I talk to real estate brokers. Eventually I hire a broker, that's the listing broker. The listing broker takes that listing, puts it into a CMS, it starts syndicating, it goes to the MLS, it gets to dozens and dozens of portals all over the internet. Another broker sees that listing, that second broker decides they maybe don't have that much business, they'd like to generate some leads, maybe work as a buyer broker. So they create a copy of that listing. Theoretically, they're not allowed to do that. They can't copy a listing that they don't have an agreement for and market. But they'll do it and they'll syndicate it. It's as simple as changing an apartment number. 
So let's say I have a listing, it's apartment 1501, the other broker lists it as apartment 15A. Or, hypothetically, they make up an address. So now, as an end user, you guys, who are out there looking for an apartment, you go to a Zillow, you go to a Street Easy, you see the same apartment, not once, but twice. In New York City, in some portals, you'll have this happening not two, five, ten times, but literally hundreds of times. Naked Apartments, part of Zillow Group, has listings out there that have hundreds of duplicates, hundreds of copies. The other, so the other problem is once you find the listing you like and you decide you want to reach out to the broker, you are going to basically click a contact button. So I'm going to take a brief survey. Who thinks that your personal information, your inquiry, is going to be directed to the listing broker, the source? Raise your hands. Who thinks that your information is going to go to the person who listed the property? You're all wrong. What's going to happen is Zillow or Street Easy is going to take your personal information, turn around, and sell it to the highest bidder. That is not the way a real estate marketplace should function. My name's Andrew, I'm the founder of Property Club, and we're building a decentralized real estate marketplace that essentially guarantees quality listings and removes third parties. We're doing this by introducing an ERC-20 cryptocurrency that acts as a mechanism to uh, facilitate uh, the verification of properties and listings by our community, by anybody who's out there. Uh, on top of this, we're, we're exploring how to use blockchain to improve and enhance user experiences. For example, by offering users new, new experiences, such as tokenizing properties, tokenizing real estate, as well as removing friction from the process. Theoretically, we will get to a point where title transfers can happen digitally on the blockchain, and that's going to drastically reduce the cost of you know, title insurance, the cost of uh, you know, potentially getting a mortgage, I get it, so on and so forth. Um, if you're interested in helping us revolutionize the real estate industry, feel free to reach out to me. We're currently uh, raising about $800,000 on a convertible note. Um, thank you. How, how was your, uh, four minutes. All right. Um, so you know how the three things I mentioned? The fourth thing is how are you going to make money? Very important. Right. So uh, essentially, there would be a subscription model. Initially, there there's an issue of marketplace liquidity, right? Well, all commercial all model, but who's paying? Agents and realtors. Okay. So right now, you basically have two models in the real estate industry. It's either subscription or they sell leads, right? They sell leads, they sell them to third parties and add friction to the process. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're initially we're going to there won't be. A, any fee, it'll be freemium. Uh, and that's just because there's there's an issue of marketplace liquidity. If we say we want, want it to be peer-to-peer, -peer, we're gonna charge a subscription from the get-go, we'll never get a critical mass of supply, and then users aren't gonna wanna use the portal. So it seems you know? like you're trying to solve a problem that's inherent to the space, but you're using blockchain to do that. Yeah, so it's, it's a, essentially, the way we look at it is initially, um, blockchain is something that can be used to self-police and to build trust. Uh, it's going, you know, right now the problem with the space is the aggregators out there are untrustworthy, right? So if we're gonna get out and say we're gonna offer a better product than Street Easy or Zillow, how is an end user gonna trust us? Through the use of blockchain smart contracts or cryptocurrency. So whenever a user goes out, they go, they verify a listing, they'll earn a reward. So is the problem that the listings can be verified? I mean, the, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because, so when we look at, in general, especially you know, blockchain technology companies, the question, first question I always ask is, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. So can this problem be solved in another way? 
Well, it, it, would, it, right? it, would, uh, it wouldn't be cost effective to solve it in another way, and there is the issue of end users not trusting a centralized source, right? Right now you have centralized marketplaces that aren't doing a good job solving this problem. Uh, and then realistically, moving forward, we see our currency and blockchain as being value-add and being a differentiator. So moving forward, you know, down the line, once we have a robust dynamic marketplace, we can start putting contracts of sale on blockchain, digital transfer of title, tokenization. There, there are a ton of use cases. How big is this problem? Is this really even the problem? In the, the, the supply? No, the, the problem you described that you saw on the blockchain. The fact that you know ads are being shot around to the highest bidder. Who cares if I get a no, no, no. That's right? that's that's part of the problem. So there are two issues. There's the issue of third parties, right. and uh, that's 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 the whole revenue stream for for Zillow Group. They you know had a billion dollars in revenue. Nine hundred million was from selling everyone you know your personal information to third parties, and that basically you know it it's, makes the process inefficient, uh, and it adds cost. You could essentially, if you don't have a third party and, and you're selling your property, there's 3% less broker's commissions that wouldn't have to be paid. But on top of that, you have the issue of you know, no universal listing standards. So there is no standard for the industry. If I list a property, 10 other brokers can well, send MLS. a copy of it. I'm sorry? You got MLS. Yes, but Zillow and, and the centralized sources don't abide by the rules of an MLS. They accept listings from all over the place. And and realistically, if an MLS had a, a you know a consumer facing product, that could guarantee quality. If you go to Corcoran.com, the listings on Corcoran.com are gonna be 99.99% accurate. But you're gonna have 10, 20% of the listings on the market. If you go to streeteasy.com, they're gonna be 70% accurate but you're gonna have 150% of what's on the market because 50% is duplicates, fakes, so on and so forth. It's, you know, we did a, a bit of a case study and, and we asked users, we showed them two sites. One was a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace where we put up some hypothetical listings, everything was 10% below market and it only had, it had very limited supply. Another was Craigslist and we asked them, which marketplace do you think has a better product? Which would you prefer? And would you recommend either? And what was really telling was a lot of users wouldn't recommend either because they had an issue with, with marketplace liquidity. So it's really important to be able to aggregate supply and, and essentially guarantee quality. Yeah. Listen, sometimes users don't know what they want. Uh, I'm, so in terms of, the, I like how you, you know, you're passionate, you clearly, you know, thought about this for a while. I don't know if, the, if you're solving the right problem, and I don't know if you're solving it the right way. Um, also, if you're doing an ICO, you might as well raise 100 million, not 600 grand. But we're not, we're not uh, doing an ICO, so. Well, besides the point. But um, what you should do is you should talk to triple men. <laughs> if you haven't already, do you know those guys? Well, they're, they're, they're brokerage, so they're not necessarily, they're a lead buyer, actually. They're part of the talk problem. <laughs> I know. Uh, I know. One, I they're they're working on some still. very, very cool technology to solve the problem of having kind of uh, you know, decentralized inventory, if you will. Even yeah, uh, their inventory is limited because they're right. they're only able to. So maybe you should talk to us. But congrats. Rules. So congratulations on that. So the next company, since Mikhail owns a bunch of hotels. Yes, who's coming? Come up here. The co-working space. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we have uh, Brennan Bosnichki with Rip a Trip. There you go. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Brennan. Thank you ERA for hosting the event. Um, tonight I am pitching Rip a Trip here on my shirt. See the passion. Um, Rip a Trip is a big data adventure travel platform. You tell us what you want to do on your next trip and what conditions or preferences are going to make your trip awesome and we'll tell you the best destinations. Importantly, we use big data, not recommendations, to kind of minimize the uncertainties when you're planning a trip. 
So the problem that we're trying to solve is that almost every travel site that you go to right now begins with a fundamental question, where do you want to go? Not everybody knows where they want to go. Often they know what they want to do and what makes for a really good trip. For example, a skier might want really deep powder, um, expert terrain, uh, and maybe really good upgrade ski. A second skier might want beginner terrain, uh, somewhere that's family friendly, somewhere that has great restaurants, um, maybe lift tickets that are under $80. Trying to find the best destinations for those unique preferences is incredibly difficult. Um, generally, people rely on referrals or recommendations, and the problem with those is those are usually generated from you know, a handful of experiences or incomplete information. Um, they're almost always biased uh, and never objective. TripAdvisor is a pretty good um, recent example of you know, the rating systems not working. The ratings are losing credibility and they are losing relevance. Um, so rip a trip, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so in terms of team, uh, I'm a single founder. Uh, I have a quantitative background, uh, two years of quant hedge fund, uh, three years managing a $7 billion external hedge fund portfolio, and four years as a proprietary trader. Uh, I also hold CFA, CMT, CAIA uh, designations, and I have a master's in investment analysis. Uh, the problem that I'm trying to solve, I don't think it's an engineering problem, but I do realize it requires technical expertise. Um, accordingly, I put together what I think is a pretty compelling technical advisory board. Uh, on that board, I have Moritz Gimbel. Uh, he has a Master's of Science in Media and Communications from the London School of Economics. But more importantly, he is the head of product at NBC Universal. Uh, I also have Tiffany Bogich, who is a Cambridge PhD data scientist, uh, co-founder of Science.ai, uh, a tech stars a uh, company that's raised over $3 million in seed capital. Uh, Chris Candy is a friend of 15 plus years. Uh, Chris is co-founder of Seven Media, which is a mobile app and augmented reality uh, developer in Toronto. Uh, Chris is leading our development. And finally, David Parkinson is a multiple Emmy Award winning meteorologist with CVS, uh, and he is leading efforts on uh, weather data. In terms of um, the ask, right now what we're looking for more than anything else is a high quality equity investor who can provide reputation, mentorship, and resources. At this point, the money is not as important of a factor. Um, compared to most startups, we can easily get to 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 users in a matter of a few months. Um, in terms of progress, which I skipped, sorry, um, we have surveyed, developed a prototype, and are currently taking the feedback from our survey and remapping the prototype into an MVP that we're launching next summer, or sorry, next month. Um, we are launching the MVP uh, initially with two sports, uh, wind sports, kiteboarding, and windsurfing. Um, we have aggregated over 100,000 data points on the two, and we are distilling all that information basically into 10 to 12 criteria that a user can make selections from to find optimal places for their next trip. What we want to do is we want to start with one sport and do really well. We want a kiteboarder to come back from their next vacation having had an awesome experience and then they have a friend who says, hey I'm looking at going hiking or I want to go on a yoga retreat, maybe a ski trip, a surf trip, whatever, any sort of activity related uh, sport that person, that kiteboarder is going to be like, hey, I'll use River Trip and have this awesome trip because I had all the details about this destination. You should check it out. I think I've covered everything a little bit out of order, but thank you. So pretty, uh, pretty good pitch overall. I'd say problem clearly stated. Uh, you, know, you spoke about the, the team of advisory, uh, relevant experience. You touched on uh, the fact that you already have a prototype, which is good. Um, you know, and you outlined kind of your your roadmap more or less. So I think all of those are good points. Um, I would have spoke about you know maybe the business plan a little bit and how you know, your vision to make money um, just conceptually and you know even at a high level. I think that's 
important to mention, even though I think you know, we get an idea. I quickly address that. Yeah, yeah. So initially, you know, our, our sole motivation is creating value, is creating a brand that people want to come to, recommend to their friends, and that is like our single singular objective. Obviously, we need to monetize it. Um, first thought is an internal booking platform. So right now, if you look at the space, it's so the entire adventure travel industry is about seven hundred billion dollars. If I ask you to name one dominant player in it, go ahead. Go ahead. We all know what that is. Triple uh, Okay. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, I I wouldn't. Uh, I think they're on their way out. But um, so I don't know anything about this space. So. What I think I'm, I'm trying to get at, at least, is specifically with adventure travel, TripAdvisor is a little bit more broader. There's no dominant player kind of catering to this audience. There's no Airbnb, there's no Uber. Um, there's no leaders in the space. So it's a fragment of industry, is what you're saying. Thank you. Yes. Um, sorry, back to monetizing. Yes, so preference would be internal booking platform. So there are hundreds of, of booking platforms for adventure travel that you have never heard of. Yep. And none of them have any different, most of them have very little differentiation and have no value. So that's why our singular objective right now is creating that value. We get the user base, we get people who want to use our service. We can then par that, parlay that into an internal booking platform. Alternatively, you know, we can do a TripAdvisor type model where we have affiliate revenue and whatnot. Um, plan A would definitely be internal booking platform, plan B, TripAdvisor type model. Plan C, don't really want to go that route, but it's an option, kind of a smaller thing would be a subscription model. Yeah, um, no, the way, yeah, I think that may make sense. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I see you. No, all right. Okay, next company is, um, is in the legal space. I think it's gonna be very interesting. It's Ziv Yosh with Yo, Yola or Yola? Thank you for coming. So imagine that you have a great product. Imagine that you have an amazing team and you're ready. You're ready to start going. So you need to so you need to form a company. You need to engage your co-founder with a legal agreement or something like that, and you need to raise money. So what do you do? You start to look around and, and I started to talk with lawyers and you realize that this this legal going to cost you a fortune. Money that you don't necessarily have at this point. You're a great entrepreneur trying to do it yourself. And you realize that you don't really know what to do. So this is where we get into the picture. And we are YOLO. We are a tech-enabled lawyer. So what exactly do we do? So YOLO is a law firm powered by technology. We use we provide legal services using our digital platform. So our platform basically automates and streamlines all the legal process from drafting documents through closing transaction. And we do it in like a fraction of the cost that a law firm will do it with 100% transparency, okay? So what are the main, the main pain points that we are solving? The first one, today, Law firms charge high fees for standard <coughs> drafting of documents, right? And for clerical uh, processing. Second thing, there is no collaborative tool that allows lawyers and entrepreneurs or their clients to share knowledge and information. There is nothing like that. It's only emails or phone <coughs> The third value proposition, or sorry, pain point, is that there is no 24-7 transparency into transaction or project progress and for fees accumulated. And the last but not least, there is no one single place that you, as a company, can see your entire, entire legal regime. So there is no a dashboard that you can basically see all your documents and run query on the documents. So how are we solving it? So our product has three elements. First one is automation of drafting a review of documents. The second one is automation of transaction processing slash closing. And the last but not least is automation of document management. Let me explain. When you go on our online platform, so you basically see the entire workflow that you as a company will need. Either it's formation or it's hiring an employee. Now let's take for example hiring an employee. You click on that, there is a questionnaire. You just fill in the questions there. 
Once you're done, you click again, and the agreement automatically drops out and comes to us, to your lawyer, for final review. More than that, you have, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to interrupt with our chatbot. Or even if you need to talk with an actual lawyer, we're going to be there for you. Once this is done, and the lawyer reviews it and basically signs off on the document, this is good, the lawyer basically clicks and releases documents to you. And you, by another click, just circulate it for, to the signatories for signatures on the document. And the last part of the, of the, of the product is that once the documents come back, so the system knows how to automatically save it in the right place. And this is the dashboard that I was talking about. And what's so, so, so smart in the, this dashboard? So this the dashboard allows you to run queries. It's intelligent to run, to run queries. So basically, by click of a button, you can see how many SAS agreements you, you, you closed last year, and what the terms of, the, of those agreements. So, okay. So I'm, I'm Ziv, 15 years of startup lawyer, 10, 10 years out of it, I spent in Silicon Valley working for a big law firm and venture one of the biggest VC there. Uh, I also co-founded a SaaS company and a startup accelerator. My co-founder is Ori Wise. He's in Israel and he's also a serial entrepreneur and engineer. And we asked for $500,000 to take us one way of 12 months and allow us to get into between 30 to 50 companies processing in our system. So, we are YOLO, and we are your tech-enabled startup toy. So the company that you mentioned that you founded earlier, the SaaS company, what happened with it? So I left it, and now they, we try, my two co-founders trying to raise the next one. So we raised $2 million in A round, and now they're going for the B round. That's a different company, nothing to do with this. No, nothing to do with that. I just moved from Silicon Valley to New York, and then I left the company. So they, my other two, two co-founders start, just stayed with them. So I, I, I was with them about one, day, one year and a half, and then I moved to New York for, for yeah. other reasons. So typically when you're doing a pitch, you don't want to leave stuff open-ended, right? Like, it's easy to just start things, but it's difficult to see them to completion, right? Right. So just something okay. you might want to think about. You might want well, to not even mention that, unless you got paid a lot. No, I got not a lot. It's like, you know, we raised about $2 million for it, so, so it's okay. Right. Um, oh, so it seems, like, yes, it seems like you're solving a couple of different problems, right? right. There's a drafting problem, right. and there's a document management problem. Right. Drafting problem, and I, you know, I, I deal with this stuff every day. It's, uh, you know, you, and I've seen a lot of companies try to solve that, and it's, it's tricky because, right, different companies have different needs, different sectors, different laws, everything. If you try to cater to, you know, everyone, you're not catering to anyone, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, you're, you're a lawyer by profession, so you know. So that's why we're focusing on startups, and our focus is from seed to A. So we are okay. attacking a standard. So you're doing very, very specific subset of the legal framework, basically. I, well, no, we believe that every startup should look the same and look the same today. So that's what we, we believe. Every startup from A, from seed to A, if it's an IT startup, technology startup, it's the same thing. At least, that's, this is my biggest belief, you know. So I spent 10 years in Silicon Valley and, and all the startups, and probably 300 companies that I, I serve look the same. They're exactly the same. And even when you see documents from five big different VC financing documents, all of them are based on the MBCA forms, are the same. Yes, well, you might be right. The problem is you're dealing with people, and especially your lawyers who want to put their own touch on everything. So, something to think about, right? Yeah. The other part is the document management system, and I feel like that's been solved before. So how would you know, your system be differentiated from all of the other competitors? So Actually, there was a company at the last uh, round table, uh, from Argentina, I think, from South, some from Latin America. They were pretty impressive. Yeah, so there's a lot of competition in space. Yeah, so there, there are the, the, the drawbacks of the world, the Google, the Google Drive of the world, the, all of those entities that you can save documents, managing, they're managing the documents. But those, those systems cannot provide you what inside the documents. Our entire system is built on that you, the client, or I, the lawyer, provides the values. How much was the name of this person? How much was paid for this person? What's the term of this SAS agreement? Was 12 months, 13 months? When it has to be renewed? And all of these values are saved on the system. So we are the only one, as far as I know, that you can run actual query on the agreement itself, going into the agreement. So who is your customer? The law firms? The no, startups. 
But I mean, as a startup, how many deals am I going to do? One, two? How difficult is it so, to track all of that? So, depends. So, it depends. If you're just starting, so probably you're going to have 20 NDAs. You're going to have five founders agreements, and you have, you're going to have at the beginning. NDAs are worthless. Nobody cares about it. I'm not, I'm not talking about NDAs. It depends what's the stage of the company. So, if it's zero to A, so limited amount of documents. If it goes from 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 A to B, so it might they might have a 50 SaaS agreement. It get as long as when the company grows, the legal regime gets more sophisticated and complicated with respect to what's in there. And if you or we basically track it from day one, so we're allowed to just provide a click of a button and the entire audit. Today, if you go you invest in company, so your lawyer is going to do due diligence to take them a month. And you're going to pay probably about $50,000. And the, the reason is, one of the reasons is because there is no, the documents are not in one place. You know, the lawyer needs to go and look for them and reach for them and understand what's inside them. We basically take it from the beginning. I agree that there's a problem. I just don't know if you're targeting the right market. What would be the market that you would target? Uh, law firms. I uh, see. So Funds, so private equity shops venture capital firms that, that have thousands, hundreds of thousands of exactly. Startup is not going to care. You know, one off and you move on to the next. Okay. Something think about. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's great. We are at the fourth pitch. At this point, we have two more companies. But uh, who here is brave enough to eventually try to come up here and pitch? Just raise your hand. Great. Awesome. Well, like, People who have startups and who are not thinking about pitching, think about it. All right, next company is we are back to real estate because we invest in real estate. Krenar Roca with Rubik Analytics. There you go. Krenar and two friends. Hi, everyone. I'm Roca. I'm Amar. And I'm Tommaso. And we are the founders of Rubik. So we have developed a software that prices any apartment in New York City giving arbitrary market condition. And we do that by using machine learning. So real estate brokers can go to our website and by simply putting basic information such as number of bedroom, number of bathrooms, square footage, and floor, they can get an immediately a price analysis report on their apartment. And we do this in seconds. Otherwise, they have to spend up to 10 hours to manually go to all this data and uh, present it to the client because they need to justify their price. So for a small real estate brokerage uh, with 20 agents, they spend up to 1,000 to 2,000 hours on this task. So right now we basically develop the software that lets agents go onto our website, enter some simple parameters like he said, and get an instant report in seconds. The technology behind we, this is machine learning. There are two key algorithms here at play. We basically use clustering algorithms to identify comparables, and there are price prediction algorithms that actually determine the actual sales price of the apartment. Um, where we want to build this product, basically, right now, is a simple report that gives you the price, the comparables, gives you market data, and justifies the whole thing. What we're building right now is a whole sales solution for them, for a broker to come in, enter the necessary data, and get a whole sales strategy on how to sell the apartment, at what price, what is the ideal time to put it on market, and what is the probability of sales. In fact, right now we're working on a price sensitivity analysis tool, which basically lets you understand what is the probability of selling this property at a given price over a given time period. In, uh, in terms of the business model, it's B2B SaaS. The price is price one is uh, $100 per seat per agent. This is based on talking to our um, customers and going moving on to traction instead of uh, um, moving on to traction. We have uh, 130 agents signed up on the platform through um, three brokerages, and they're currently piloting the project. So basically, they're using our software to benchmark against their internal pricing reports. And we expect to start making revenue this month. So in terms of team, we believe we're a really good team. We met uh, five years ago now. Uh, it's been a long while. The very first weeks of, uh, of college, of Colby College up in Maine. And uh, just a couple weeks later, we had already started our business idea. It was a local delivery service for goods. Uh, on campus within 24 hours, but uh, past that we worked together uh, for four years on business uh, ventures, we've been roommates, best friends, and uh, at the end of college we decided to uh, raise a friends and family round of $25,000, and uh, since then we have been bootstrapping, and that was about a year ago now we graduated. So. Um, 
Rubik is our mission to provide tech, uh, technology and actionable insight to real estate brokerages uh, in this moment, at least only in New York. Small and medium sized real estate brokerages is our focus. And for that reason, we're raising $250,000 uh, for an 18 month runway. And how the money will be split up is 60% uh, operational costs, uh, including IP development. And then there's, uh, the rest will be split up in marketing, sales, and data and technology. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, uh, I really like your pitch, guys. It's uh, very clear to the point. You didn't waste uh, time talking about anything other than pro you know, clear state problem, clearly stated solution. Uh, you, know, you said you already you have a prototype. I like the fact that you brought, brought up that you guys worked in the past before. So I've seen that happen a lot of times where you know, you're hiring people and there's usually a J curve where it takes time. You remember from kind of business one on one, the storming, norming, all that stuff that's supposed to be important, but it, which it is. So clearly, you guys have worked together already. You know how to work together. Uh, you built a prototype. Um, you recognize that there's a problem in the industry, and instead of saying, "Hey, let's go out and raise a million dollars," you said, "Oh, why don't we put some together to solve it and see what happens from there?" Which uh, is, you know, looks like what you've done. I think that's the right way to do it. You you, you test um, your, your solution, the markets, to see if it works. And uh, so, where are you guys right now? What's your run rate? Right? Uh, run rate right now. Uh, how much? Yeah. Yeah, we're looking to raise 150k for 18 months run rate, basically. Okay. Forward, and the idea with this is basically to get up to 50k customer, just like 100k MRR. But it's uh, you have a publicly uh, accessible website. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Our, our prototype is ready. Uh, it's up and live, and they're the brokerage we're working with right now are uh, benchmarking. Uh, our valuations and our proper reports compared to theirs. Uh, the way, so uh, over this past year, not only those $25,000, but we've also been uh, working kind of freelance to enhance brokerages' technologies. And so that's where we came uh, with the idea for them asking us to produce these pricing reports for them. And we realized, it's interesting. Right. It's interesting because you're not competing with brokers, you're enhancing. Yeah. Their, you're, getting, you're making their brokers perform at a more efficient level. So, how many users do you have right now so far? There's um, so 130 agents in total. Sorry. 130 agents in total. It's three different companies that are now benchmark users. You know, we haven't gone really aggressive with the sales. We just wanted to go there and right. see if they wanted and then build up. Are with they it. paying customers? Uh, they agreed to be. Yeah, I expecting to pay in May. We have one firm already. I mean, we're just kind of split. This is one reason we're raising money because we had we have to bootstrap on the side and do things on the side while we're working on the product because one of our customers is really itching to actually try it out and they want to do the pricing because it's saving so much time, so that's... What's uh, the competitive landscape looking like? The closest competitor right now is Urban Digs, so the couple things in that they've been around for 15 years, but they have not too many clients. The only big ticket client they have is Keller Williams, but what they do is they produce very basic pricing reports for the data and they don't have too much data available in the market. What we're trying to do is go beyond that, give them advanced insights. So how long should I keep this on the market? When should I put this on the market? Basically use AI and all the data to give them a strategy, how to set up and execute them. So basically nobody's doing what you guys are selling. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so this level of sophistication, no. other than maybe in-house tech like Compass, that might be a thing, but Compass doesn't share its technology with anybody else. Yeah. So that's the, that's the advantage. They were a tech company selling to brokerage, not a brokerage company trying to be tech enabled. We should apply to AI already. Oh, we have it. We have it. <laughs> <laughs> Interviewing? All right. You should be interviewing. All right. Good job, guys. Thank you. Because there's interview them, um, we have to interview. Great. So, last company. But after this company, we are going to play a game, and we're going to pick a company to come up here and pitch. Uh, there's a bunch of cash here. Mikhail brought. That was awesome. Uh, cool. So the last company is actually, I think they are, they are from your home country, Mikhail. Alex, with peer click. There you go. That was like, that watch you speak for us. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm Alex, and I'm from Belarus. So. USSR. USSR. Yeah. Near, near from Russia. <laughs> So, uh, before we start, I'd like to ask uh, yourself, do you know how much time you spend trying to manage ad campaign in Google, in Facebook, maybe in LinkedIn, or maybe all of them? Before you answer, 
I I have one two point of view. I have not. I just uh, named only a short list of advertising resources that you may have used. But what would you do if these campaigns are numbered in dozens, hundreds, thousands? I'm sure you never want to be in position of losing time and money because you just have not responded quickly. But we have found a solution. A solution that allows you to track, manage and analyze all of your ad traffic in one place. Making your advertising more effective and profitable. It's not a simple analytic dashboard. With AA-based algorithm, per click now how to redirect users between thousand different landing pages and offers in accordance with customers' behavior. Just imagine, it describes a great opportunity for regular marketers and marketing agencies because it leads to maximizing ROI and reducing ad costs. Why we are the best to resolve this problem? It's pretty simple. Our team has a strong knowledge and great experience in digital marketing, data analysis and development. We absolutely know what is needed to bring Perclick to the next level. In conclusion and as confirmation of my work, uh, I'd like to tell you some facts about us. Two months ago, we started our billing plan and now we have more than 75 paid subscriptions with 300 users worldwide. It brings us more than 5,000 months of recovery revenue, it is still growing. Now we are looking for strategic partnership to accelerate our growth. Thank you for attention. And so, you know, forgive me, I don't know that much about the space, but you, know, you mentioned that there is clearly a problem managing effectively advertising. Right? And sure. So, but you didn't go into the de details. So, it's supposedly a big problem, and it's uh, nowadays we focused on uh, affiliate marketing. Uh, it's uh, it has a great volume of traffic now uh, billions trillions clicks it per day. So if I will talk a little more about you know, specifically why does that problem exist, right? And then you know, the other side of that is you, know, you talked about the, your solution. So something you you mentioned at the end, which is important, is that you have paying customers, which they're probably paying you for a good reason. So. But you haven't really talked about your product, you didn't say exactly what is the problem you're solving, how you're solving it, and uh, you know, why, if, if you're solving it better than your competition, right? So I will talk about all of those things if I read the pitch. Great, thank you. Good job. So now, if you would like to come up here and pitch to Mikhail, please stand up. And if you're standing up, sit down. <laughs> I mean, like, if you don't want to pitch, sit down. All right. Cool. Great. Thank you. So, Mikhail, here's what we're going to do. You're going to say something like, if you have a co-working space, sit down. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. So, you want to eliminate people. Okay. Oh, say anything? Okay, All right. If, uh, if you... All right, let's see. If it's an international business and nothing tied to US, sit down. You thought about it. Okay, go. <laughs> no US. No US. Are you doing something in the US? Yes. If we do something in the US, then. You can. All right, cool. Exclusively outside the US, probably. <laughs> more radical. More radical. All right, if. Uh, I don't know, you want to help with this one? Okay. Maybe like let's eliminate half time we let them pitch like one sentence. But if you have no revenue, sit down. So if you have uh, if you don't have a prototype built, please take a seat. <laughs> In other words, if you have a prototype, you're good. Okay. How about this? Let's have one sentence from everyone, and then Mikael will pitch pick someone from the one sentences. So one sentence. Quantitative analytics, we come from the finance industry, 
Three. That's good. Uh, we may just stop electronics or factory. Or changing how you discover IT talents. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, music, stock market, investment platform. Okay. <laughs> I'll summarize. Hi, I'm Donna, this is Gal, and we are the two, a digital event planner focusing in the world of kids. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Sean from uh, Nomad. We simplify, we physically simplify uh, the on-demand beauty service space for barber styles and makeup artists. Great. Cool. What's your pitch, also? Yeah. Yeah, one um, I'm Tom Riley. We are. Uh, Jeff from Wiki, we provide AI powered introductions to real local insiders for best things to do, favorite places to go, and restaurants to try. Okay. Cool. Hi, I'm Chase from Pluto, we're an analyst platform for businesses to measure and improve their diversity, inclusion, and belonging in the Alright. Uh, my name is Dalton Han. Uh, Founder, uh, co founder of Poppin. We are a on demand fitness uh, marketplace where users access fitness facilities and, and pay by the minute. Yeah, my name is Nikita. I'm from Russia and I uh, make a method of rehabilitation on attachment for any wheelchairs. And we do an uh, ecosystem for disabled on blockchain. Hardware for disabled people like wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. got it. No. Hi, my name is Miko. I'm the co-founder of Moodbit. We are analyzing the mood of the place to improve the levels of engagement. Josh Bogrowski, uh, co-founder of Initia Office. We build the world's best co-working spaces. Mm -hmm. um, Main Streets. I work with uh, Main Street stores, products and services, and we use a catalog of 4,000 uh, dropship companies to increase their revenue. Great. Thank you. So, Mikhail, pick one. All right, I'll, I'll have to go with the paint because I've never actually encountered someone cool. in that Great. space. So, three minutes. Sounds interesting. Congrats. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kirk Duraini. My name of my company is called Around the World. We find a solution to an everyday problem. One problem that we have today in society is a lot of hit and run accidents, copper wire being um, theft, um, self-driving cars. <laughs> and um, the, my idea comes is called microtagging for paint vehicle. I have a patent on it. And what they do is that you put the paint, the paint have the VIN number. <laughs> um, the VIN number is in the paint. And you put the, and then you spray the paint onto the vehicle. I have a prototype. And this is the prototype here. It's so small you can't see with the naked eye. Um, and it, you have the VIN number into the paint, and you spray it onto the car. And when somebody hit an object, or a person, or another uh, vehicle, the paint will transfer from that from that car to another car, and you got, you will have the VIN number in the paint itself, so you could trace the car back. Oh. I have an um, um, issue patent already. Congrats. What are you doing with that? I'm trying to get uh, investors to market it and put it on the market. Yeah, so you need like, to build up the rest of the business plan, right, get some initial seed investments. Uh, so what would be your ideal uh, I guess, customer for you to I will sell it to um, Caterpillar, um, New York City Transit, Con Ed, because Con Ed have a lot of copper wire stolen, and you could put the, the Con Ed logo on it, and you could put it onto the copper wire itself, so it could adhesive onto the copper wire, so when you go take it to the, um, to the junkyard to sell it, 
the scrap metal yard, they would, um, they would have said, okay, this belongs to um, Con Ed, we cannot buy it. So most applications you mentioned involve you know, hit run, some kind of car related. Yes, of the automotive industry. So what about going to the suppliers of paint for the car manufacturers? It's like um, DuPont, I, I, I don't know if it does it, but yeah. Yeah, DuPont, um, M, M3M, yeah. and um, base, basic coding. So strong, one thing to think about, and this applies to I think broader kind of landscape of startups and just companies that we look at, mostly within the startup world, is that um, what you've developed is a feature, right? So, and the exit strategy for a feature is substantially different than an exit strategy for a company, which is something to think about. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're amazing idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's pretty awesome. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for coming. Uh, now, Justin will take all the area questions. Mikhail is here for you to uh, come up here and talk to him. Thank you for coming. And uh, some people may go across the street to Beer Authority, second floor. I don't condone alcohol, but like, you know, some people may go, so the same. Thanks for coming.